Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Matthew and I've got the privilege of being here with Dale Morey and he's going to be sharing his life testimony, how God brought him out of darkness, brought him into God's wonderful light and I've, I've been privileged to know Dale for about five years now and just seen God, what God's doing through his life and ministry. So it's an incredible salvation story, it's called Hope for the Hopeless. Amen. So hi everyone, um, my name's Dale Mori, yes. Uh, so I was born and raised in Tukoro, uh, over the Kaimais here, although my people are from Thames Hauraki, and uh, I'd say I had the normal upbringing for a, a bush town back in those days, and we had our own dysfunctions going on, and a lot of that uh, a lot of the, the dysfunction was translated into my early teenage years and carried on into my uh, most of my adult life. And uh, where are we? So I didn't really uh, do well at school. I didn't attend uh, very much once I started going intermediate in high school and stuff like that. I started acting out. Uh, come to the attention of the social welfare in those days and uh, became a state ward and so into the boys homes and family homes and stuff like that but things would start you know you start running away and, and going on the run from the police and getting into all the mischief that uh, comes along with that lifestyle and uh, I remember maybe I was about 12 so I'd been mischief, been sleeping on the streets and all that sort of thing. And we were standing behind a church and we were, um, uh, we were sniffing glue, a whole bunch of us street kids in the early 80s. And these Christian guys come out <clears throat> and when they came out from behind their church, from in the hall, they had been running a youth group and it was called Te Haora. And, uh, and we went to run away and this one guy, he said, don't run, come in. And so at that at that age, that was my first introduction to this guy named Jesus. And eventually, under the ministry of like uh, Paul Somerville, who's gone on to do a lot of stuff in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, I became a Christian after listening to Kevin Mad Dog Mudford, I think it was. And we gave our lives to the Lord, and something changed. And within a short space of time, came back to the Lord, uh, came to the Lord, and things started to happen, you know, I was sort of at peace, happy. Um, actually went back home rather than sleeping down at the railway tracks and stuff like that. And then, after a short space, the little mischief bits inside me, I remember, um, we were, I was sniffing uh, petrol with a cousin of mine and, and, and I was praying. <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but I prayed and I said, and I was about 12, maybe 13. And I said, Lord, if you give me till I'm 30, then I'll come back to you. Because as a 12-year-old, you think 30 is old and you'll have lived all your life and stuff like that. And what happened after that, within a short space of that, um, I stole my youth leader's car and we took off and went and tried to live on the beach in um, Papamore, I think it was, way back then. Ended up getting arrested back into the boys' home and the whole cycle started again. And that cycle just continued in run away, go and live on the streets all around New Zealand, get caught back in. Then I think when I was about 16, I was in a place called Kohitere. <coughs> it's shut down now. It was a, they called it a um, youth prison, I think it was. I don't know how they term it in those days. And, uh, and I was meant to be there till I was 18. And so I was in the, I was in the, block they caught it when you're locked up in your cells and you, when you're out you do um, PT and uh, I remember the day I turned 16 and I was singing this song and I, and I was singing um, Oh Mum because I was you know 16 yada 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 my cell door opened and the social work, welfare guys the social workers they said pack your gear you're off we're sick of you you're gone you're going to prison from now on and so then I went back and Took her all, 16 year old, 
You know, I'd, I'd been sort of on off working with my um, dad's bush crew as a little gopher. Uh, when in between times being taken away. But what that fella said happened. You know, within the next year I was back in prison. And that just started the uh, adult um, prison cycle for me. Then the gangs, the gang membership, the drug taking, and it all started to come to a head. You know, I just, it was just getting all on top of me. In and out of prison, most of my 20s, I just had no plan, no focus, just trying to be some kind of tough guy. But I, uh, I'd say around about, I think I was about 29, and, and by that time I was really heavily involved in uh, meth, uh, selling it around the country and had a lot of people working for me. But my drug addiction was through the roof, just phenomenal amounts of uh, money, just you know going up my nose and, and living that lifestyle. And I remember I, I'd been, you know, I'd been a subject of a, couple of armed offenders call outs and the last one I'm, I'm sort of condensing it a lot but the last one happened in um, Tauranga and I think that was oh I can't even remember the year now but I that was the last one where I went to prison and I was facing an attempted murder trial and uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a raging um, drug addict, man, I was, I was so sick, mentally sick, hearing voices, I, you know, I used to be in quite good shape and doing a, a lot of stuff and and when I turned up back there I was, I was just a sick, emaciated drug addict and I had nowhere to turn. But un, unknown to a lot of people who thought I was just crazy and, and, and had, there was, um, I couldn't be helped. So for the previous year, I'd been trying to find God because I remember when I was a kid and I, and I had this happy time with God and then when I turned away, things just it just all turned to rubbish. And, and I'd been trying to find God, but on my own thing, I, I, I didn't want to give up any of my attitudes, the stuff that I was doing, and it wasn't working. And when I came to, I was going to, over a lot of money, a, a person I'd been working with in the scene for a lot of years, I, I'd, I'd almost shot him in front of his family because it was a lot of money, and and I was so desperate, and and things were just not working out, and and something stopped me, and I know now looking back, it was God stopped me from shooting my friend, and uh, I uh, so. Instead of pulling my gun out and shooting him, it was like this force stopped me. And so I turned away from him and I started walking out of his house. He was there, you know, and he was um, there with his family, his wife and children. And, and I'm walking out and he's following behind me and he was saying, oh, bro, I'll pay, I'll pay, you know. But I didn't want him to see me crying. And, I, and, I, and I'd been crying and I just said, don't worry. And I got in my car and I backed out and I headed onto the motorway um, up in Auckland out of Manurewa onto the motorway. And by the time I hit the motorway, I was just this blubbering, crying mess. You know, I mean, I hadn't cried like that for I don't know how long. I was absolutely howling, just thinking of what my life had become and the things I was doing to people, you know, all through my 20s and things like that. It was just, it was disgusting, you know. And uh, I was heading down the motorway and I had planned then, I was going to, because, I had a couple of children by then, but we had um, we had we had finished, and I had chosen the life of drugs and and all that sort of stuff and and just selfishness. And I was heading down the motorway, all so confused, and I decided I'd shoot myself under the Bombay overhead bridge. And I'm motoring down the car down the motorway, and I got to the Bombay overhead bridge, and and I had and I had a um, a sawn down four. It was a um, four. Oh, I forget the name of those four 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 ten shotguns. I think they were called. And I had it at my head like this, and I was crying like a, just absolutely bawling my eyes out. And I come under the bridge, and I went to shoot, and I couldn't do it. So I let off the hammer, and I and I threw it down in the passenger's seat, 
And then I looked up and I said, if you're real, I need your help. And I would, how would I describe it then? It must have been a piece because I'm a $10,000 a week junkie by then. I'm a junkie. Just all I cared about was where my next fix was coming. And uh, this piece came over me and I headed back. And at that time I was living in um, uh, Mount Monganui. And uh, I, I won't go into that, what all that was about. But, uh, and I went back there and this peace come over me and I, whoa, you know. And then after a few days, I started to get it all, you know, hyper anxious, drug addict, needed, needed my fix, da 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 da. And I got involved in a, um, another serious, uh, a, a, a very serious piece of violence. And um, <clears throat> so the armed defenders were called out. And uh, I probably won't talk about that one too much, but I'll say there was a supernatural experience that took place, and if I had more time, I'd, I, I could tell you um, sometime, but there was a supernatural thing that took place at the top of the Kaimais. And it was like God showed me that all the weights, all the, all the physical training and all the stuff you you, you do the tools you're doing to try and be tough and intimidating on people so you can keep getting the drug money and that. With all that, it didn't matter. I was powerless when it came to the spiritual realm. The things I saw and the things I heard showed me that I was little more than a grain of sand in the higher and the bigger scheme of things. And it almost sent me crazy because uh, I realised that everything I'd ever heard about the Bible, about um, angels, demons, all that stuff, I realised it was true from what I saw and, saw and what I heard. And, uh, and I almost went crazy. And in the end, I, a few days later, I, 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 was walk, I was going around in some days, you know, um, the the car had the car was in the window was shot out I was carrying guns around I was just in a daze and I ended up getting arrested and um, not by the armed defenders but by uh, um, the ones that um, had cooled down I got arrested and I ended up in prison and what what I'm remembering is this <clears throat> when I when I had the gun at my head and I said to the Lord if you're real I need your help because I've become everything I hated. The person I'd become through the drug addiction and my behaviours, I, I totally disgusted with that person. I hated myself. And that's why I wanted to end my life. And then I said, you know, if you're real, I need your help. I want out of this lifestyle. And, and I ended up in prison. And you'd think, oh, no, you're looking at um, attempted murder, kidnap, home invasion, discharging firearms, all this. Oh, no, your life's over. For, for a while, I thought my life was over and, and, and stuff like that. But I got taken out of the scene and I started to look for God. And miraculously, the pastor in the prison I was in, waiting on remand, he led me, he relayed the gospel to me, and I became a Christian. And things, I was still a drug addict, and nothing changed just straight away. But something was beginning to happen in me. When, when, when I had bowed the knee of my heart to Jesus, when I had asked him to forgive my sin, all the sins that I'd committed I never thought I could be forgiven of, God forgave me through his son Jesus. And what happened, I, I started this new journey, although I didn't recognize it at first. But within a year, I had become a different person. I was praying, I was free from the drugs, and even that was hard. I was, you know, I was on the cell floor in remand and I was crying and punching the cell doors and swearing as the drugs, the need, the hurt, the anger, everything in me was just it was just it was just coming out. It was a terrible time, but it was the best of times. And <clears throat> you know, going to prison while I was waiting for this trial turned out to be the best thing that happened to me. And miracle of miracles. When, when I came up to trial, and I'd just been putting everything aside and trying to find out about this Jesus that I'd known as a child, is he real? Can he change? Can he change me? And it was true. He could if I would, if I would work in partnership with him.
And what happened? I went up to high court trial and God worked a miracle unknown to me. When my lawyer come to get me for trial, the police said they would withdraw all these charges if I would plead guilty like a plea bargain. So I did it. And so looking at life, you know, uh, imprisonment and, and, you know, 13 years would have been a, um, probably a good um, sentence. I got such a short sentence out of this, um, out of this uh, deal that I, I was happy, you know, and I, so, I, so I went back to prison and I just started focusing on trying to find out about this Jesus, trying to find out if I could be um, accepted and loved by him even after my, even after my past. And I found out I've been in, in the faith now for 20 odd years, almost 20 years, and I can tell you right now that if you will repent of, 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 of what you may have done, these things that have offended a holy God, and I, it, it seems too easy, but it's the hardest thing that I found was to bow the knee of my heart and say, yeah, I've, I've made many mistakes, and if, if you can forgive me and help me, I'll, I'll try not to make those mistakes again. And God is faithful to his word, and God never leaves you, and he's helped me through all these years. And there was a lot of stuff that needed to be undone. There was a lot of apologies that needed to be made to um, family members and people I'd hurt uh, along the way. But slowly but surely, um, all the animosity and stuff that, that was really against me, um, I, don't, I don't sense it now. And uh, <clears throat> what I can say, it was the best thing I ever done. But, you know, the gospel's free. What Jesus done for us is free. It's a free gift, but it will cost you everything. You know, if you're going to hold on to unforgiveness, if you're going to hold on to pride and say, oh, I'm not going to, I don't need this Jesus, then we're not going to make progress. But I can guarantee you, if you will, if you will bow the knee of your heart to Jesus Christ, he will come in and, and, and take up residence in your life. And he, will, he can forgive you for anything you've done. And he can change you and transform you and build you up and give you a new life and a new start. And my encouragement today is to um, find out about this Jesus. If you get, get into a church or get talking to some Christian you might know and find out about this Jesus. If he could do it for me, he can do it for you. He wants to do it for you. He loves you so very much. So we just had the awesome life story, the beginning part of his journey to God, the ups and downs, the in prison, but meeting Jesus. And after him getting saved, almost 20 years ago now, God actually released him into ministry. So I'm going to ask Dale to share about some of the things he's done and how God has used him. After, after being saved, I uh, got involved with local churches. And uh, so I did things like um, feeding homeless, Stuff like that. Um, what else? Back in the early days, did a bit of um, prison ministry. It was a miracle that uh, I was allowed back in the prisons. And some of the fellas, when I went in to run services, there were fellas that I'd been in prison with, and they were saying, "Well, man, you know." And so that was a good opportunity to tell them that <clears throat> Jesus can change you. And so, and 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 a lot of them did actually say. Man, if Jesus can change you, he can change anyone. And so uh, I was blessed to see a lot of, a lot of guys uh, come to faith. And, you know, whether they've carried on or not, I can't say, because a lot of them, you know, this is going back years and years and years now. But I hope and pray that they've seen how faithful God is and stayed there. And, uh, <clears throat> but more recently, probably um, since about 20, I did 10 years of prison ministry, I think, and then uh, I got involved with um, just, yeah, in, in recent years, maybe seven years, I suppose, or five years, or I can't remember exactly how many years. Uh, I had a traumatic event happen in my life, and it really shook me up. And, and it, it, I started to question God, and I was asking him something, you know, why, why, why? And it was, I was angry at God, and I was frustrated, and I was just seeking answers. 
And I was saying, why, why, why? For two years, and I was sort of shaking my fist at God and, and wanting these answers. And he said to me, one, one, one day he said to me, Dale, you've been asking me why for two years. I want you to build a cross, write the word why on it, and go around and ask people why they think Jesus did it for them. So he didn't answer my question, but he told me what to do. And I was not a happy camper, I tell you that. I just, you know, I just, I just wanted the hurt to go and all that sort of stuff. Because I tell you, with this event that happened in my life, I was actually suicidal. Even as a Christian, I was suicidal. I was, I was, my heart was broken, my life was over. Um, <clears throat> so begrudgingly, I ended up getting this cross built. And I would... Um, <laughs> I would stick it out the top of my back car window and I'd drive because I didn't know to make them that fold in half and, and I'd drive to different places and I'd get it out and I'd walk around and I'd just walk around and talk to people and a lot of them would say, because I had why, I've got why written on my cross and they, they'd say, hey bro, why are you doing that? And I'd say, well the real question is, why did Jesus do this for us? And it was just a way that I was able to engage them in conversation. And then, you know, and I'd share my story of, of how out of hopelessness I found a hope and that I found that life could continue no matter the, the, the heartache that we were feeling, that God would never leave me. And I was able, once I could experience that personally, I was able to convey that to other people and that God was understanding what they were going through and stuff like that, and that he, he, he's our biggest supporter, and, and, and too many times we hold him at arm's length, and we, we, we're quick to blame him when something goes wrong, but when things are going right, are we still so quick to blame him, thank him, praise him, you know? And, and so I was taught a, a, a few things like that, and I believe it's um, helped me um, mature uh, a bit as a, as a Christian, but also as a person, and just realize that the self-talk that uh, I sometimes um, come under, you know, the negative self-talk, that's, I don't believe that's emanating from God, you know, I don't believe that he's, he's calling me worthless and pitiful and stuff like that, but he's saying, you're my son and I love you, and uh, he, he wants to say um, things that would encourage me and build me up, and, and you find those things out through reading his word and, and praying with him and talking with him and asking him why to, to some of the questions that you have in your life. And, and so that was the beginning of the ministry. So I'd walked around New Zealand for a long time in different towns and you know, not, not all the time it was good. I got threatened to get a hiding a few times, but God was very graceful and, and, uh, and, and, and took care of me. And in recent years, I was uh, blessed to be able to go to Fiji and take the cross to Fiji and, and walk around Fiji and talk to um, Fijian people uh, and the Indian people in and, and, and different villages and, and just, and I was made to feel very welcome, you know, I got to even share with uh, Hindus and, and uh, Muslims and, and it was, it was, it was, it was exciting, it was cool, it was neat. Uh, and actually staying with uh, Pastor Matthew's parents-in-law. That's, um, so that was an interesting uh, turn of events as well. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I've done a couple of uh, jaunts over to there to, to just share the gospel, share my story. I, I, don't, have a, um, I don't have a big arsenal of um, a scriptural um, degrees or anything like that, but I've got my story. And I don't think, um, if you think that all you've got is your story, I'm telling you, it's, if, if, if you've got something that Jesus has done for you and you can share that with others, you're going to speak hope into someone else's life because you don't know what other people are going through. And if they can get hope that even in the darkest times there's somewhere they can turn, there's someone that's willing to accept them, then, then your story's gonna be, gonna be just as powerful as all the degrees in, in, in you know, in the in the world, you know, because the Bible says that we are acceptable to Him in the Beloved, and so I just try and stay in Jesus and try and try and just convey that to others, that what Jesus done for me, He can do and He wants to do for you. Thank you. Kia ora. 
been so good hearing your story and God's blessing upon your ministry. How I first met Dale was through a woman of God called Ali Eagle, who has recent times passed away and she's gone to heaven. But I'd just like to ask you to give a bit of a tribute, just the way that she also blessed your life yeah. and encouraged you in God and what a woman of God she was. Yes, talking about Ali. Thanks, um, Matthew. Ali Eagle, um, I, I met this beautiful lady when I was attending a church with my family down in Otaki, and she had started a, a, a she was a famous artist, very talented, and she had started this um, project about repentant men. And she went and saw the pastor in the Otaki church, and she said, Pastor, I'm looking for repentant men, da di da da And I just attended the church and in the last few weeks, and I was talking with the pastor, and he's, he knew um, part of my testimony, and he said, go and talk to that man. And that started this beautiful friendship. And then in the end, she was, I would call her mama, and she would introduce me as her boy. She was a beautiful woman, this famous artist, and she would convey the message of the gospel in her artworks. But she also conveyed love to me. She was one of the most loving and compassionate people I'd met. And I just, yeah, just want to honour Ali Eagle. Alison Mitchell was her name. Her painting name was Ali Eagle. Just want to, and I, um, yeah, just want to honour her. She was a precious lady. And, yeah, so thank you. Hi, I'm Ali Eagle. And I've loved Jesus for many years now. Um, he came to me when I was desperate and I needed, I needed him, I needed to be completely made new and I was amazed at how, how he just was so gracious and in coming into my, into my heart, into my spirit and changing me. His love for me uh, is everything, I can go to bed at night time and do my own thinking um, but then suddenly turn over and think you are here with me, Lord, and you have healed me, you have changed me, you have transformed me, and you've given me a new mind. Whenever I get people to do their interviews, I often like to ask them to close in prayer and say a prayer for those who are watching. If maybe someone out there has got suicidal thoughts or drug problem or they're in a hopeless situation or maybe they think life is so great and but they don't have Jesus, I'd like you to pray for them. Okay. So Father, we just want to pray for our loved ones out there, even uh, people we don't, we might not know them, but Lord, you know them. And so Father, we just lift these beautiful people to you and I just encourage you if if you're looking for someone to reach out to, you can reach out to um, Pastor Matthew through his channel or through his church, in Mokoroa Community Centre. You can um, reach out to me on Facebook, um, but you can reach out, and we're, we're here to help. And so, Father, I just pray for these beautiful people that may be listening. I pray that you'll sustain them. I pray that, Lord, they'll know your goodness, your love, that you have poured out for them and how important they are to you. So, Father, bless, bless these precious people who are listening. And, Lord, bless us all. In Jesus' name, amen. I just give a final thanks to you, Dale, and blessing upon your life, your testimony, your ministry. And I pray that God will use you more and more to touch other people's hearts. Amen. You have a good heart, soft heart, moulded by Jesus. God's love always be with you. Amen. Thank amen. you. Amen.